Um, what I'd like to talk about um, is modern manufacturing. Uh, it sounds, and it's, I'm not surprised it's not an attractive thing, because manufacturing, uh, do we do that anymore? I mean, I thought that was all done in China. Why, why would I be interested in this? So I hope to persuade you by the end of the, the evening, and I hope you'll then persuade others, that actually uh, the UK is a very important place for manufacturing. Uh, but even if it wasn't, then manufacturing is important, uh, and it's not what people think. It's not about bashing bits of metal in dark satanic mills. So I'll do what it says on there, pretty much what it says on there. Uh, and I want to start by saying that modern manufacturing is this full cycle, understanding markets, uh, understanding uh, the technologies, the product, process, the design, process design, operations, all the way through to services and sustainability. So for me, you may say this sounds a bit megalomaniac, but services, which everybody says uh, is the way the world's going, uh, are actually an integral part of this broader view of manufacturing. And um, when you get as old as I am, you get invited to chair committees and things. I've just been chairing a review for the government on measuring manufacturing. Because if you look at the standard industrial classifications, it looks as if manufacturing is really small. And you hear on the telly, oh, it's only 8% of the economy, so it doesn't really matter. What they don't tell you, because they don't understand what you're about to understand, uh, is that actually that production, that physical bit in the middle, is hugely influential on all the other parts of the economy where you might actually capture some value. And the, the, the one headline that's coming out of our report is that if you look at the national statistics, it looks as if there are 2.7 million people in manufacturing. If you look at the people employed in manufacturing in adjacent parts of the value chain, which are directly attributable to physical manufacturing, is 5.1 million. So that's my killer statistic. Um, uh, and really the point here is that we used to think about having great big factories and all those poor so-and-so slaving away uh, under the yoke of those ghastly factory workers, you know, and it, I'm sure that people still think it's like that. And frankly, it was until relatively recently, and there are probably still some of those left. But generally speaking, it isn't. And what's changed, apart from the great big factories, uh, is that what we have these days is uh, an industrial system which has broken up into these different activities along what we like to call the value chain. So the production bit in the middle there, almost the middle, just to the right of the middle, um, is what many people think when they say manufacturing. What we would argue is that that's production, physical production, but the whole saga is about turning ideas and opportunities into products and services. So uh, to illustrate this, uh, Plastic Logic, you may have heard of. Anybody heard of Plastic Logic? Um, rather famous startup here in Cambridge um, where they developed some of this, the technology for flexible screens. So they're squirting blobs of gleep onto bits of plastic. It's a bit technical, I know. Um, uh, but what they're actually doing is researching into the, uh, the physics of manufacturing. So this is a... Who's in the Cavendish? Somebody. Um, yeah. Uh, and this is Richard Friend's stuff, um, who you would know, of course. Now, I would argue that that's R&D, uh, but actually it's part of the manufacturing cycle. And Richard would agree. Uh, we're at one on this. Here's Apple. Uh, well, it's about the phone, isn't it? And they're all made in China. Well, yes, they are. And that's a longer story to have, perhaps. Uh, but in fact, what Apple focus on the, is the, the design, part of the manufacturing cycle. Zara, now, uh, I'd like to say it once, I do not wear ladies' clothes. Um, but uh, not would be a problem if I did, it's, per it's perfectly normal, a small percentage. Let's not go there. The point is that Zara, uh, and you would know the, the shop, um, have been very successful, partly because their clothes look nice, I suppose, um, I, I don't know why you wouldn't, why you need any more than a blue shirt and grey trousers and a red tie, I can't imagine, but apparently some people like more variety, never seen the point myself. Um, the, the serious point about Zara is that um, they have a very highly integrated um, 
production control system. So they don't make in the Far East, they make in Europe, but they have such a responsive system that let's imagine I go into a Zara shop on a, a Saturday and I look at the, uh, the green spotty frocks and I think, ah, oh, yeah, not sure. No, 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 no. I'll come back next week. If you come back next week, they won't be there because Zara have mapped the trend in sales and they will then replenish with products of a similar style um, in, very quickly. So if that's selling, I don't have to wait three months for them to come from China. I can get them made within a fortnight. And so highly responsive uh, design and production linked together. I, you'll all recognize this is a constant velocity joint. Um, so <clears throat> your car with front wheel drive, clearly you need to get the drive from the engine to the wheels and still be able to turn the wheels. Uh, it's not so good, is it? Now, as you will be aware, there's not a big demand for cars that only go straight on. So these are uh, rather important. Uh, and GKN is a very famous old British engineering company, about 250 years old. And they have 40% of the world market for these products. And this is what generally people think of when they think of manufacturing, making really clever bits of metal in large volumes in factories. Uh, well, that's okay, and they do very well. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not the whole story. So Tesco's, what has this got to do with manufacturing, I hear you say? And I, I'd like to argue that if you want to imagine modern manufacturing, stand at the checkout at Tesco's and imagine how that stuff got there and look back down the supply chain. So I ended up in London at a rather posh do, not quite as posh as this, but pretty posh. <laughs> and uh, um, so I'm talking, so if you stand at the checkout at Tesco and this rather county woman at, at, uh, from the body of the hall, about 250 people in the hall, goes, oh! Now the English will understand that perhaps more than, it's a rather cultural thing that only happens from certain parts of the English population. Uh, and so I now always say it doesn't need to be Tesco, which some would regard as rather down market. It could be Tesco's or Waitrose or Fortnum and Mason's, depending on your sort of... Uh, so the, the point is it doesn't really matter what the shop's called. Uh, I would encourage people to stand at the checkout and just think for a minute, how the hell did all this stuff get here? And actually what's happened is that the, uh, the retailer has orchestrated that whole production system from understanding the market through to getting all the stuff there so that you can just wander in and buy whatever you want from anywhere in the world. And we take that for granted. Uh, as some of you will know, there are lots of places in the world where actually you can't do that. It's not the norm. It's bloody amazing. Uh, Xerox. <coughs> Again, uh, none of you are quite as old as me, but it used to be that you could, couldn't buy a Xerox copier uh, you had to hire it, and uh, you just paid per page. And then the Japanese, who, if anybody likes manufacturing, you should esteem highly because they're fantastic. They could actually make copiers far more cheaply than Xerox could rent them. Um, and still the best factories in the world are in, in Japan. Uh, but the point here is now what we would call a product service system. So um, what they will do uh, is offer you the service of running the information in your business. So uh, the, the machine is important and they're doing some other interesting things like remanufacturing with all sorts of products, only little bits that wear out and we throw the whole thing away. I mean, why do we throw a motor car away? They don't rust these days, they don't wear out much. It's just that we want a new one, that can't go on. Um, and in fact, we're gonna end up using transport as a service rather than uh, buying cars, crazy business. Um, but service part of the, uh, the engineering spectrum. And of course, no talk about manufacturing be complete without Rolls-Royce. <clears throat> Rolls-Royce make these wonderful jet engines. Uh, they have over 30% of the world market for civil aerospace, civil aero engines. A Rolls-Royce engine is worth more than its weight in silver. That's cool, isn't it? So that's how you add value by engineering. Uh, but the interesting point is, once upon a time, you used to sell these great chunks of lovely metal. I'd have one on my mantelpiece if I had a big enough mantelpiece. An absolute work of engineering and artistic genius. Uh, but huge cycles in the demand for aircraft. 
So Rolls-Royce would end up selling the engine at a very marginal cost and then try and make their profit by selling blades when they wore out. Well, it's a hopeless business model. Um, and so what they now do is sell the service of power, power by the hour, they call it. Uh, they've got a new name for it now. The point is, they say, you have our engine and you pay us a certain amount a month and we will guarantee to provide power on your aircraft. And that has all sorts of advantages. First of all, it smooths their revenue stream. It's not up and down, you know, and now I can sell it for a million quid, now I can only get half a million, uh, nightmare. Dreadful business to run. Secondly, they, they, get that, well, they get that smoothness, but now they get an intimate understanding of how the customer is using their product. And so they can now say, right, I'm going to sell it to you at X pounds an hour, uh, but do you know what? I can now see how to make it much more efficient and I'll keep the change. Um, that's not what they say on the brochure, but it's a great business model. So um, I hope to persuade you that manufacturing is not just about those dark satanic mills, but about that whole range of activities. Uh, and though people may say we don't want those ghastly factories, you certainly want all the adjacent bits of the value chain where you might be able to use your... Uh, expertise, your science, your whatever, to capture some value. And if you're not making the bits, uh, you may not get the chance to make a business in the adjacent bits. Uh, well, we are in university, I think, so I thought I ought to say a bit about this. Um, we tend to think that researchers uh, are all, all a bit weird, long hair, orange trousers, only work at night. Uh, that's the popular myth. And, of course, there are different kinds of um, science down at the bottom there, um, there are some of those folks, and there's nothing wrong with that. If people want to wear orange trousers, it's no business of mine. Uh, they probably think I'm weird for wearing a blue shirt. Uh, but the point is that there's an activity down there which is essentially curiosity-driven science, and that's fine. Uh, then there are enabling technologies. Who actually creates the technology, synthesizing the science into something that you could deploy? But it's probably f fairly generic. And then it's actually applying it to particular things. So we might be doing some fundamental work on metallurgy. We might be developing the technology for a turbine blade if we're Rolls-Royce. And then we might be designing that into a, an aircraft engine. Um, now, this is pretty complex here. This is a bit of uh, major synthesis. This is a grid. You probably spotted that. Uh, matrix, even, if you want to be really sophisticated. But if you see the value chain along the top, and those levels of uh, types of research down the side. In the pub public mind, um, research is, are those rather weird people who get this half-baked idea and they take it to somebody in the R&D department at a company and then they rush back to their laboratory and do some more of whatever it is they do. Um, and the point that I would like to make is that uh, there are, uh, across this spectrum, different kinds of research going on from the boffins at Plastic Logic to the rather grubby engineers at GKN to the people doing stuff like how do I business model Xerox business systems. Um, and so uh, I use this to beat up um, research councils and say, <clears throat> well, and my colleagues, to say, you know, let, let's map the potential of research onto the whole business system and not just think of it as um, a, a little bit of science passed over to somebody at the front end of the value chain. So in my old, my old work, five weeks ago, uh, we built up the, the Institute of Manufacturing to uh, link engineering and management and policy and education, research and practice. Now, this is an abomination. It should have been strangled at birth. shouldn't happen in a great university. But somehow we grew from about 50 to 250 people. Oh, God knows what they all do. Um, but really it was an attempt to fill a gap uh, in the space between discipline-based departments and real industry. And so um, we were rather broad, which people told me was definitely not going to work, and very close to industry, which is obviously very shocking. Um, the kind of things we would look at as our exploration, for want of a better word, research. Science is fine, but it's about, un not but, and it is about understanding how the world works, and that's fine. And I like to say to my very distinguished scientific colleagues, science, science is lying around there, 
Um, and if you don't discover it, somebody else will. But engineers have to create things that have never existed before, and that's really interesting. And actually, you'll find the really classy scientists absolutely get it. This is not, I mean, I, it's, I do it for a bit of fun. But important to separate the activity of scientific exploration and synthesis for a purpose, it seems to me. Uh, we can argue about that later if you wish. So we would look at things like industrial innovation. How does that work? What do you need to do to be able to, to do that? We would write, that's a, a workbook you can buy for 30 quid <coughs> on how to develop your technology intelligence system if you're a company. Industrial sustainability, really big issues. How do you uh, make industries which are sustainable so we don't uh, wreck the planet? Uh, uh, and globalization, how do we understand what the hell's going on? People are making stuff all around the planet. How can any particular country, whether it's UK, China, uh, America even, um, how do we decide what value we can create and how we can capture things depending on our particular capability? So th those are the kind of uh, research questions that we tackle in, in the IFM, which is quite unusual, as you would gather. It's not science, and I wouldn't claim it was. It's not even uh, engineering. Um, and some of my more purest engineering colleagues worry a bit about this. It really, but it really sits, it's more like uh, medicine. Uh, it's actually studying uh, real systems uh, that you could measure, you can see, you can touch. So in the early days, when we were setting this up, I had my tanks ready. When people say, well, you know, we don't do that here. What's this manufacturing nonsense you're all going on about? And I say, well, look, I'm not telling you how to study your subject, but I can tell you uh, that I can take you to manufacturing, I can describe it, I can measure it, I can make predictions about it, so it's a legitimate field of study, so bugger off. Um, I never had to, astonishingly. I um, don't know how we got away with it. They probably weren't listening. Uh, just a few words about what happens in different countries, because this manufacturing malarkey as you appreciate, is now uh, totally global. Um, states uh, still an absolute powerhouse, doing a lot more on um, green R&D than you would imagine. Uh, having actually a renaissance in their view of the importance of manufacturing, they went through, in the UK, we went through two decades when we thought manufacturing didn't matter. Uh, states... They're never quite so stupid as us. I mean, we believed all this nonsense about free markets where uh, you guys in America are much more sensible. You made sure you were uh, funding the research system for production through the military and through the healthcare. But it's these stupid Brits who thought, oh, free market, it'll be a great idea. Um, Americans are much more sophisticated than that. But now realizing that they have lost some traction and uh, the, the kind of Apple model of designing thing made in California, uh, designed in California, made in China, seems such a brilliant idea until you realize, blimey, we can't make anything anymore. And actually, losing that ability to make things inhibits your ability to innovate. Europe, uh, well, what it says up there, some rigidities is France. Nobody here from France is a. No, I can say that safely then. Um, What's the cause? Sorry? What are the colours given? No idea. I think it's just pretty <laughs> colours. Uh, I don't know what would uh, I don't know what we have in common with Russia. Well we've got Jeremy Corbyn there. No, maybe not. Um, the, the point is fragmentation is if you take a, an area the size so one of the advantages America has is a huge, reasonably homogeneous market. Uh, in Europe we still don't have that. Um, India, fascinating. Um, very democratic, but there's always this comparison between I India and, uh, and China. Um, infrastructure uh, lagging is uh, delicately put. Um, I, I anybody, anybody been to India? I should go, it's amazing. So um, I was there a couple of weeks ago, driving from Mumbai, which is on the left-hand side, up to Pune, which is a new industrial. It takes four hours on a long, winding road with these great lorries with coils of steel on, you think, going at about five miles an hour. I just hope he doesn't break down because he's going to roll back and crush us. Um, that said, uh, India has a lot of people that uh, need jobs. 
And if you've got a high labor content uh, production activity, you might very well want to put it in India rather than China, which is a worry for China. Um, but there's a lot of things to fix in India for that to work, right? Uh, China, extremely clever. I was first there in 1987. Uh, when the, it was just a single track, well, not single track, one carriageway in either direction from Beijing to the airport and quite a few hay carts. It's 1987, and it sounds a long time ago to you, but it's only 30 years nearly. Um, and if you took the plane from uh, Beijing down to Shanghai, uh, there were ladies sweeping the runway with uh, twig brooms. <coughs> you think, blimey, this is never going to last. Uh, the transformation now is that it's an absolutely humming metropolis. If you go to Beijing, Shanghai, it looks like a capital city anywhere on the world. Too many cars, uh, people having a high standard of living, uh, quite remarkable. And the trick that's being pulled off now, of course there's some wobbles, and the people of different persuasions like, well, it's going to fall over, complete rubbish, you know. And then you say, so... 15, 20 years, you'll correct me, uh, growth rates of over 10%, slip down to 7% now. Mm. Oh, nightmare. Um, imagine what it... Below 7%, 6.9. 6.9, oh, God. Um, I imagine what it takes to manage that uh, and very cleverly to bring in external investments, now build up the internal market so that all that production is going to the home market and it becomes self-generating, very clever problems, of course, um, but uh, not to be underestimated. And Japan, <coughs> well, poor old Japan's been forgotten because they were supposed to be the way of the future 20 years ago, and then something went wrong, and they flatlined, and it's all a bit of a nightmare, and they've got uh, deflation. Um, <coughs> so I was having dinner with a fairly senior Japanese industrialist, and I said, well, I, I can't really see why deflation is such a problem. That means if I'm an ordinary person, I can buy more stuff. So why is that so terrible? Anyway, I, I don't think he was on the same wavelength as me. Um, but uh, more seriously, uh, if you, who's been to Japan? It's wonderful, isn't it? Absolutely fabulous. People have a relatively high standard of living. You can walk anywhere, night or day, anywhere in the country. People are very civilised. Uh, it's... Um, how much have they got wrong, actually? You know, we look at these economic indicators. Uh, I'd rather live in Japan than a lot of other places on the planet. Uh, and they've got issues, of course, with an ageing population uh, and natural disasters, which are ghastly. But their ability to work together... Um, and uh, <laughs> it sounds like a terrible name drop, but I was out there with the president of MIT. You've heard of MIT. Uh, for my sins, <coughs> I ran the um, Cambridge MIT link up for a while. And so we were talking about this. And I said, well, the difference, Susan, is that um, in Japan, people live very closely together. And there's only paper thin walls, a lot of people, not much flat land. So they have to be very cooperative. Whereas in America, what you did was ride out into the prairie, uh, stick up a fence and shoot anybody who came near. It's just a different style. <laughs> she didn't quite know how to cope with that. Um, uh, <clears throat> last slide, you'll be relieved to hear. Because this is builders talking about innovation. Uh, and what I want to persuade you that, uh, is that manufacturing is not uh, the opposite of innovation, which is often how it's come over. There are those boring people in boring factories making the same thing every day. Uh, we just got to get away from that because that's in the past. Well, actually, no, uh, at many levels. First of all, if you can uh, innovate your production process and make things faster, cheaper, uh, that's innovation. And you can make more money from your idea. Um, uh, and I would like to persuade you that um, that is real innovation because the innovation is not just the idea or the invention but taking that right through uh, to somebody who can use it uh, and benefit from it. Um, a bit about the value chain stages, um, I think is sometimes helpful just so we know what the research is for. And I'm rather into global industrial 
ecosystems. They're not now just ecosystems of making stuff. They're ecosystems of innovation. It's one of those difficult words, ecosystem, of course, <clears throat> because um, Cambridge is a bit of an ecosystem. I like to think of an ecosystem as a muddy pond. It's got reeds and water boatmen and fish, and they all sort of live together in some kind of balance and harmony, but we can't exactly predict how, what's going to interact with what or how it all works, except it does, and there's some equilibrium. And modern manufacturing is very like that. And I was trying to explain that to some visitors. I was saying, well, um, in this muddy pond, Cambridge is a bit of a muddy pond, um, but remember chemistry. When you did your chemistry, if you did science at school, to speed up the um, reaction, you put a Bunsen burner under the vessel, and that speeds up the reaction. Now, obviously, you can't put a Bunsen burner under Cambridge uh, because it's too big, and so you have to use alcohol instead. <laughs> I, I realize I'd lost them somewhere along the way. But the point about ecosystem is important, even if we don't understand it terribly well. It's much more like that, with many actors interacting in different ways, rather than some nice straight line which goes from scientific discovery to making loads of money. Um, uh, and I would say this, wouldn't I? But I think uh, there is a real need out there for people who I would call industrial system architects, who can actually understand this whole system and how it works. Um, that's not an alternative to people having deep discipline-based expertise, uh, but it's an essential complement to that if we're going to make, some, uh, make the most of ideas. I've done.